Hello. The uh, title of uh, today's seminar, Unwelcome Critics, is a theme uh, close to the hearts of me and my friends at Academia SG. Uh, we've always tried to be hospitable to academics and ideas that are of public interest, uh, even if they are not welcomed by the status quo. Uh, this year, we want to explore the theme of unwelcome knowledge in greater depth. At the end of the seminar, my co-editor, Tio Yu Yen, will share these plans with you. Right now, though, it's my great pleasure to welcome two scholars intimately familiar with our topic, Sol Iglesias and Walid Jumla Abdullah. Uh, I first got to know Sol around 15 years ago when she was a director at the Intergovernmental Asia Europe Foundation. Uh, working with her then, I recall being in awe of just how smart this young public servant was. I admit I lost touch with her after she joined academia at the University of the Philippines. Uh, so I must thank our peers at the National University of Singapore's uh, Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences uh, for trying to invite her for their conference yesterday, uh, thus acquainting me with the meaningful things that she's been up to in recent years. Uh, although they were not able to follow through with their invitation, Academia SG is only too happy to fill the gap. Uh, Walid Jumla Abdullah, like Seoul, is a political scientist uh, based at the Nanyang Technological University. He's one of Singapore's leading scholars on religion and the state. Uh, he's also one of the most knowledgeable and insightful researchers of Singapore's electoral politics. Uh, Walid and I have uh, shared interests and barely a week goes by when I'm not learning something new from him. Uh, he is best known in Singapore as the host of the uh, political talk show, Tetarik with Walid. Uh, over the last 100 days, his presence in Singapore's public sphere has been especially valuable, even if not uniformly welcome, as a voice of conscience on the war on Gaza. Uh, with these introductions out of the way, let me pass the mic to Saul. Thank you so much, Sharian. Thank you to... Um academia.sg for this invitation. The Philippine case uh, offers an urgent impetus and opportunity to monitor the impacts of threats to democracy on academic freedom. And that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, especially so given heightened tensions around the 2022 uh, election of President Ferdinand Marcos Jr which was facilitated in large part by historical revisionism uh, and distortion of the legacy of his father, Ferdinand, former president, ousted dictator, Ferdinand Marcos Sr. So Marcos Sr. had declared martial law, uh, military rule in 1972, and ruled in a, in a dictatorship until he was ousted, mainly through protests, popular protests in 1986. So is academic freedom consequently constrained in the Philippines today and in what manner? I argue that there have been serious risks to academic freedom in the country uniquely pertinent to the Marcos Jr. administration with some continuing from a prior period of democratic backsliding towards authoritarianism under former president Rodrigo Duterte. So you have those two of them on this slide. Duterte on the left and Marcus Jr. on the right. I, I offer preliminary findings from ongoing incident monitoring that I've undertaken as part of the Network in Defense of Historical Truth and Academic Freedom, a group of scholars, researchers, and educators brought together by the election of Marcus Jr. to the presidency. Now, free expression encompassing academic freedom is the oxygen of democracy. In fact, academic freedom is protected uh, in the Philippine Constitution, which states that academic freedom shall be enjoyed by all institutions of higher learning. So a decline in the quality of democracy can thus be expected to possibly result in uh, and track with constraints over academic freedom. So some of the main uh, indices of democracy in the world, like varieties of democracy, for instance, uh, the varieties of democracy or VDEM uh, project, they consider the Philippines, uh, they consider that Philippine democracy has backslid towards, uh, towards authoritarianism. Uh, VDEM in particular uh, finds that the Philippines has fallen from the ranks of democracies 
as early as 2020 during Duterte's presidency. Similarly, the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance uh, by 2021 reported that they considered the Philippines as a backsliding democracy uh, or experiencing a decline in democratic quality without full collapse into authoritarian rule. And in the Philippine case, uh, it's from a position of relative democratic weakness. So I've monitored over 20 incidents of historical distortion and academic freedom since the start of the Marcos Jr. government from July 2022 to December 2023. The inclusion of incidents uh, generally conforms to uh, ways of tracking uh, threats and risks to academic freedom, mainly by the international NGO Scholars at Risk. Uh, but I also include additional categories such as historical distortion or revisionism, red tagging, which I'll explain further, surveillance and harassment among other categories. So what have we found? Two patterns emerge and I'll talk about the first, Academic freedom risks in the Philippines are a direct consequence of state-sponsored historical revisionism and distortion of public memory under the Marcos, uh, the, the distortion of public memory of the prior Marcos dictatorship. So I'll talk about education in general first. For example, uh, the Department of Education issued a 2023 directive to erase references to the Marcos name in relation to the Marcos dictatorship on the very eve of the commemoration of the declaration of martial law last year. The directive sought to strike references to Dictadura Marcos or Marcos dictatorship and instead refer to Dictadura or simply a dictatorship, a dictatorship without any context. Similarly, in August, 2022, uh, the Commission on Filipino Language or Commission on Rikang Filipino Banned, banned five books. Like we, I can't even imagine I'm talking about uh, book banning in this day and age. So they banned five books on ludicrous charges that they encouraged terrorism, excuse me, terrorism and the destabilization of the government. The books were censored for containing, quote, anti-Marcos and anti-Duterte contents. And this is a sign of the times. They didn't even bother to specify which Marcos and which Duterte they were referring to. After all, uh, Duterte's daughter, Sara Duterte, was Marcos Jr.'s running mate and is today vice president. Despite the withdrawal of a majority of the commissioners from the original book ban, these books have yet to be published or distributed. Furthermore, historians speaking against historical revisionism benefiting the Marcos government. These historians who tried to set the record straight have been vilified, attacked online, and threatened with harm. So looking at uh, the second pattern in academic freedom and risks uh, include McCarthyist red tagging, as I mentioned earlier, primarily from state institutions that are then amplified by less identifiable sources online on social media in particular. So while not originating from Duterte, because most of it started, a lot of it, the intensification started then. I mean, after all, red baiting, red tagging, and similar vilification is practically as old as communism itself. This pervasive red tagging of opposition and dissent as communist today continues from uh, the Duterte administration to the extent that uh, the United Nations, the European Parliament, for example, they have recognized that the practice of red tagging is a particular threat to civil society and free expression in the Philippines. So the academic community's concerns over red tagging are in response to violent attacks and even extrajudicial killings, as well as targeted harassment and intimidation that members of the education community have suffered. Uh, for example, uh, two volunteer teachers, Chad Boop and Jojo Ryan Alce Nuho, along with three others who, are who were volunteer teachers for an indigenous Lumad school, 
were killed supposedly in an encounter with the military, but there is some evidence to show that it, these were extrajudicial killings. So uh, even volunteer teachers are not spared uh, from, from the possible lethal consequences of red tagging. Vice President Sara Duterte herself is concurrent Secretary of Education, as well as co-vice chair of the National Task Force to End Local Communist Armed Conflict, or the NTF LCAC. Uh, which has been the primary red tagger on the side of the government um, since uh, her father's administration. And Ms. Duterte has singled out teachers and their unions labeling them as communists. Red tagging has led to profiling, monitoring, harassment, disappearance, and violence in many cases. And it's targeting universities as well as their faculty, students, and officials. And this is what we see in the first 18 months of the Marcos Jr. administration as well. For example, shortly after the May 2022 election, the Philippine News Agency, which is the official government web-based newswire service, published a story alleging that my colleague, uh, Professor Danilo Arau at the College of Mass Communication, teaching journalism, uh, at the University of the Philippines, they alleged that he was, uh, or they repeated allegations that he was a leader and operative of the Communist Party of the Philippines. The allegations were made by Jeffrey Salis, then Secretary General of Sambayanan, an organization of, of uh, former communist rebels, as they uh, claimed to be. Salis, now on the uh, Duterte friendly, Duterte and Marcos friendly uh, uh, Sunshine Media International News Network. Uh, online, uh, Saliz repeated these allegations just last month uh, on a program with former anti-communist uh, task force spokesperson, Ms. Lorraine Bado. So Saliz accused uh, Professor Arau of recruiting students uh, into the Communist Party and Badoy commented that parents should ask their children if Arau is their professor, warning them to be careful. Now, compounding concerns over red tagging is the Anti-Terrorism uh, anti Act of 2020 that was uh, largely upheld by the Supreme Court in December 2021, despite multiple legal challenges. So members of the higher education community argue that the law contains vague and overly broad uh, provisions on the definition of terrorism and related acts. And these are inimical to academic freedom and human rights. In the interest of time, I'm gonna to try to conclude and if there are any questions, I'll deal with them during the interview. So is academic freedom more constrained in the Philippines today? While recent indications that government peace talks with the communist National Democratic Front uh, which is the negotiating arm of the Communist Party and uh, armed New People's Army. As these peace talks may resume, the Marcos incumbency has, ad has advanced nevertheless state policies and practices aimed at the repression of left-wing groups or individuals, as well as perceived regime opponents and dissidents, broadly speaking. There has been a de-escalation of violence, but not a complete elimination. The contestations over martial law memory create new and pronounced risks for academic freedom because the truth about martial law and dictatorship is exactly what's at stake. State-sponsored revisionism is asymmetrically more powerful and better resourced, repressive in its effect. Historical distortion has unfolded within an increasingly coercive political environment that has targeted communists or quote-unquote communists with le lethal violence while elections remain somewhat competitive and free. And this is why I say it's democratic backsliding without full collapse into authoritarianism. So this decline of democratic uh, or democracy's liberal aspects, while its electoral dimensions remain intact, needs further study. Still, academics are increasingly among those in the crosshairs. So I've tried to offer I've tried to offer some uh, early indications in trends uh, in the repression of academic freedom and dissent based on ongoing data collection and monitoring. 
So monitoring the extent of harm and risk is key to communicating what these threats to academic freedom are and that the very fact that they exist. Now, in the meantime, academics fight back with the tools at our disposal, mainly the truth. There's been a bumper crop, as you can see on the slide, of new books on the Marcos dictatorship uh, amidst the uh, more popular, I'm afraid, uh, movies that have uh, served to extol uh, and revise the history of uh, the Marcoses. And more on Duterte's government will come, including projects that I'm part of. Academics stand in solidarity with one another through unions and efforts at institutionalizing protection of academic freedom and human rights. We work with civil society and with supranational authorities on human rights like the United Nations and keep them informed over what's going on in the country. Okay, so I think I'll just stop there for now and um, I'll be happy to take um, any questions in the discussion. Thank you. Uh, we can't hear you. Okay. Thanks. Uh, you can uh, unshare your slide, I guess. Uh, I, we, I already have loads of questions uh, for you, but let's hear from Walid first. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you to Prof. Chiran and the Academy SG team for inviting me. Except for Palestine. Except for Palestine, The Limits of Progressive Politics, that was the title of the book by Mark Lamont Hill and Michelle Plitnik, outlining how so-called progressives in the, uh, in the States, in America, are progressive and liberal on every issue except for Palestine. And this particular episode in Gaza and Palestine, and don't forget, the West Bank is still occupied, there's still violence in the West Bank, even though it is not in Gaza and Hamas is not ruling the West Bank, has underlined how pression the title is, in my opinion. And in my own circles and beyond, I have witnessed this firsthand. Liberals who oppose the occupation of others' lands, except for Palestine. Interfaith advocates who demand that people condemn violent actions undertaken, perpetrated in the name of religion, except for Palestine. Academics who always take the side of the repressed, except for Palestine. Human rights activists who would pontificate and lecture others on taking the side of the oppressed and talk about allyship, except for Palestine. Feminists who are concerned about the treatment of women everywhere, except for Palestine. And I think we do not have to go far back in history to witness these double standards. Just a couple of years ago, when, when we, the world witnessed the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, the illegal invasion of Ukraine by Russia, everyone, not everyone, but most people were displaying righteous anger, the tears, the condemnation. And yet, in this particular episode, we are not witnessing the same from the same people and institutions. And of course, there are many academics facing trouble in, thankfully not myself or not yet, uh, thank, uh, many academics facing trouble for being pro-Palestine in, uh, in academia being pro-Palestine and getting to trouble is not new. Various individuals have openly stated that their stances, their works on Palestine have gotten them into trouble. Uh, Dr. Norman Finkelstein is perhaps the most famous case of this, but there are others as well. John Mersheimer and Stephen walked through two extremely prominent senior political scientists have highlighted how their book on the Israeli lobby was perhaps the most controversial in terms of how it was received. And they knew that it was going to be controversial. Canada CBC reports how pro-Palestinian voices in academia and beyond are suppressed in Canada as a result of anonymous sources reaching out to their employers demanding action. A poll done by the University of Maryland and George Washington University, the Middle East Scholar Barometer, found that most US academics self-censored on this issue. And when, when asked on which issue they, they most felt the need to self-censor, 81% said criticisms of Israel while only 11% said criticisms of Palestinians and 2% said 
criticisms of U.S. policy. So in America, it seems academics feel more free to criticize U.S. policy, the U.S. government, than the Israeli government. Uh, and maybe I should have declared my loyalties and background from the outset. I come from a family which discusses politics a lot ever since a young age. Uh, I was named after a politician, actually. So if you Google Walid Jumlat, you may not get uh, you may not get me. I won't be the first person that comes up, a Lebanese politician. And I was introduced to the Palestinian issue at a very young age, maybe six, seven years old. So it it this is not not exactly a new issue to us. My my brother's name is Yasser Arafat. Named after the Yasi Arafat. And Muslims have traditionally, way before this, have traditionally felt extremely passionate about this issue. And the, the Al-Aqsa Mosque or the Temple Mount is a holy site in Islam as well. And the Palestinian issue has been something that Muslims have felt passionate about. But also, it has been a cause that has been championed by the Global South for the longest time. Post-World War II, uh, during the Cold War, the Palestinian issue has been sort of the, the battle that the Global South saw as emblematic of the Global South of colonialism and uh, settler colonialism and so on. So people like Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Malcolm X, Desmond Tutu, and of course I understand that this is an academic audience, uh, the late great Edward Said, have all unabashedly weighed in on the Palestinian question. The Bandung Conference in 1955, the Non-Aligned Movement Conference, which was a, not repudiation, but it was to show the, the West and the East that there was a third bloc, the Non-Aligned Bloc, comprising largely the Global South. It was perhaps the first time that Palestinian rights were acknowledged at an international forum as Dr. Nahid Samur has argued. And interestingly, just as a side, China was one of the most outspoken countries on this issue at that conference. And I'll get to this, to this. I'll get back to the significance of this at the end. But for now, my point here is this. There is a depth of hurt and anguish within the Muslim community worldwide on this issue. And anyone who really has even a cursory understanding of Muslim societies would know that there are deep divisions within the Muslim community, Muslim communities, whether it's theologically, jurisprudentially, politically, and many, many more. Right? But there is one thing that really, really unites most Muslims, and that is Palestine. And the depth of this hurt may not be appreciated by someone who is not familiar uh, with Muslim communities. And I would say in this episode, the hurt has intensified many full times. Just yesterday, a friend of mine asked me, a colleague of mine, a friend of mine asked me whether Singaporean Muslims actually felt about this issue because he didn't see an, a public outpouring of support as compared to when he went to Malaysia and it was so visible. And I told him, yes, definitely. Of course, the political system is different. The, the ways you can show your, your support are different. But online, you can see a massive outpouring of support from people of any political orientation. And I also told him, just to, to give a sample of the emotions felt, that every Friday, uh, the mosque in Singapore do a special prayer on this issue, and there will be a lot of tears by grown men, tears shed by grown men, every single week. And simply because of the scale of violence and destruction, this time is a bit more intense, a bit different. But also the fact that the Palestinians have penetrated the biases of mainstream media through their postings, mostly on Instagram. Palestinians who have long been dehumanized have managed finally to show the rest of the world that they are and have always been human. And there are Gen Z journalists there, Motas Azaiza, uh, Hint Odari, uh, Palestia Alaka men and women, young men and women who are risking their lives to show the world what is going on. And when the veteran journalist Wael Dahdu, who had already lost his wife, daughter and younger son to Israeli strikes, he led the prayers for his older son and then went back to document the horrors his people were facing, he humanized uh, his people. When the 13-year-old 
girl, Alma, told Alma, told rec rescuers who heard her voice from under the rubble, and all of these are online, the videos. The rescuers heard her voice from under the rubble, but she said, don't save me, save my family members here first. They are under the rubble. I think she humanized her people. And when uh, Khalid, the grandfather, helped his granddaughter's uh, lifeless body and, and said that you are the soul of my soul. And he humanized uh, his people. And it is a pity that these scenes needed to be shown to the world to remind them that uh, Palestinians are indeed human. <clears throat> I must say that for me personally, this episode has sort of been a bit existential, and I would say existential with a lowercase e perhaps. Um, I have started to rethink and reconsider the concept of allyship. Uh, I mean, I cannot pretend that I am not disappointed with friends and people whom I respect, whom I thought would be sympathetic to this cause. Of course, I'm still friends with them. I still respect them. People who are usually concerned with human rights and repression, but are suddenly silent or ambivalent. And it's such a complex issue, they say. I don't know enough, they say. Right? Excuses that they themselves would not tolerate for any other issue. And uh, I mean this in some ways, I would rather deal with an unabashedly pro-Israeli supporter uh, as compared to the wishy-washy liberal. Right? Uh, while we would disagree politically and morally, at least I know what they stand for, right? And I can respect that courage of conviction, even though I disagree with them. And it also reminds me that any allyship should be based on principles which I stand for and not for any represent. Uh, reciprocity I hope to receive uh, because if I do something in hope of reciprocity uh, I would be setting myself up for disappointment and of course at the same time I am heartened by many many people in, in Singapore in the UK throughout the world including the western world uh, who have spoken up on this issue they've demonstrated every week there'll be demonstrations uh, in London or in the UK and it gives me comfort to see this, especially from young people. And these are the true progressives in, in my eyes. Reverend Manta Isaac, who comes from the place of Jesus' birth, Bethlehem, said in his speech on Christmas Day, uh, it was entitled Jesus Under the Rubble. And he said, I'm paraphrasing, he said to our European friends, I, our European friends, I never ever want to hear you lecture us on human rights or international law again, and I mean this. And your charity and your words of shock after this won't make a difference. And I know the words of shock are coming, he said, and I know people will give generously, but what words of regret won't suffice for you. What has been done has been done. And I think when the dust has settled, I hope the world will not forget uh, the people who didn't display the moral clarity that any decent human being should have. Um, one day, hopefully, hopefully, Palestine is free and we will see free from occupation and we will see uh, people trying to visit it, paying homage to historic figures and so on. And we have seen this before, right? There were people who actively tried to stop Nelson Mandela and his cause after he became the figure, the moral figure that he, he was, um, they went over and they said words of tribute and so on. And I'll, I'll be ending soon, my final two paragraphs. So as a political analyst, there are really three things I wanted to point out, uh, political observations. First, I truly believe the world is at a crossroads now, especially when it comes to the notion of international law and international institutions itself. So we've already heard the Prime Minister of Israel say that even the hate cannot stop us. He has openly said <laughs> that whatever, basically he's saying whatever the international judgment is, it, it won't stop him. And the Western governments have been backing Israel. I think I remember Joe Biden said that uh, he pledged unconditional support from, from uh, Israel. And can you imagine that word, unconditional support? Even my wife doesn't love me unconditionally, right? Nor should she, right? She shouldn't. Love and support must always be conditional. 
uh, but Biden said that. So I think it's very difficult to take exhortations by Western governments about human rights and international law seriously ever again till they acknowledge their complicity. And I do fear that the notions of international institutions and international law itself have been or will be upended. And I think that's really going to happen to, to, to a significant extent. Second, I think Joe Biden and Western governments have only themselves to blame if the global South go to China or other actors uh, and try to create a multipolar world. Right? I think we've already seen movements in this direction. We are going to see it uh, accelerated. And third, imagine if this is the issue that gets Trump uh, re-elected, and I don't think that's uh, beyond the realm of possibility. I think the idea that people tell uh, progressives or the Muslims or the Arab Americans that, oh, you must always vote for us because the alternative is worse. That is that is something I think from what I've seen, the polls and even from uh, talking to American Muslims, they've rejected that in this, uh, in this uh, episode because they said they cannot uh, they do not want their votes to be taken for granted. Right? So I'll end with two quotes. Uh, so those are the three main observations. I'll end with two quotes. One is uh, from the member of South Africa's legal team, Blani uh, Nikhali. She said, some might say that the very reputation of international law hangs in the balance. And I agree with her depending on the ICJ judgment. And in fact, not just the judgment, how the international, how the Western powers react to the judgment. And second, from Martin Luther King Jr. And he said, and I never understood it as much as I did during this episode. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Okay, thank you. And I'll be happy to take any questions later on. Thanks so much, Wallet. That, that was uh, so much to think about. You know, I feel like just taking a break now and let it all digest. But we, we do want to uh, move on to uh, questions for both of you, uh, to Saul and Wallet. And uh, let, let me kick it off by asking um, uh, Saul to, to pick up in a way where you left off in the idea of uh, of resistance. Um, you, you mentioned... Um, uh, seeking support and getting it, I guess, from civil society, from unions, and so on. Uh, uh, what I didn't hear you mention, I'm not sure if I just didn't hear it, was uh, university administrators. And how how have universities uh, been protective of their faculty? Uh, I should Thank also you. ask about uh, the institutional media, mainstream media. Okay. Thank you, uh, Cherian. Yes, uh, university administrators have been uh, supportive. Uh, this usually manifests in uh, the release of statements condemning particular incidents, right? So uh, in the past, uh, at what, I, what I can say um, from, from my own personal observation at the University of the Philippines in particular, uh, but also in, on other campuses um, is that usually um, serious cases do merit or do see some kind of uh, institutional response, particularly particularly from liberal, progressive, or even let's, let's call it left-wing uh, universities like my own. Uh, this is why we get red tech when I say stuff like this. But uh, yeah, uh, in terms of the mainstream media, Yes, I think that the, the coverage usually, you know, we have pretty uh, good quality media outlets. There's uh, the Philippine Daily Inquirer, for example, Rappler on TV, um, well, now on cable, ABS-CBN. All of these news outlets have been under a lot of pressure, particularly under the Duterte administration, but that hasn't quite let up. But, you know, they, they, they do often, journalists, academics, you know, we're part of the same sort of broad, uh, civil society umbrella, and we do support one another. And in terms of reporting, you know, the reporting is of good quality and balanced when things like this happen. I wonder if I could uh, ask you a second question that in a way uh, feeds off um, a point that, a very powerful point that Wallet made, which is that often um, what we, not, not so much what we fear, 
but what certainly is emotionally uh, more painful uh, and more troubling is the reaction of friends rather than enemies, right? Uh, of uh, people whom we thought were ideological allies, but for whatever reason, uh, and maybe for legitimate reasons in the case of the Philippines where people do need, uh, you know, it's for their own survival, maybe to keep their heads under the parapets. Uh, is that something that you that resonates with you? This this idea of feeling a disappointment at the lack of uh, allyship, or is everyone are all academics uh, uh, in this uh, struggle to resist? Well, I think within the academe, though the um, the the predominantly, you know, there's there's there is a sort of concentration in the. Uh, uh, for lack of a better term, progressive liberal camp on both the Duterte administration as well as the Marcos one. Um, this is probably the one sector in society where this concentration is, uh, is, is, is evident because clearly the elections show that we are in a minority. So uh, in terms of solidarity, this has not really been too much of an issue. In fact, part of the reason why university administrators do make institutional responses is that they're accountable, for example, at the University of the Philippines to the University Council, which is the sort of assembly of members of the faculty. And we often um, discuss these kinds of issues. I myself, have re I, I myself was recently elected to the University Council's Committee on National Policies and Programs which is usually the source of like policy agenda setting when it comes to the university council commenting on political issues of the day. And the council, I take it, uh, is a proper institution of faculty governance rather than stacked with loyalists and so on of the government. I mean, the council is the, the faculty at large. You know, we meet regularly at least once or twice a semester. Right. And sometimes we talk about political issues and make statements. At the University of the Philippines, for example, is maybe the only uh, major uh, Philippine university to issue a statement on Palestine, for example, mm. and call it a genocide. Right, right. I think these details matter because, I mean, certainly speaking as a Hong Kong academic, that is one of the uh, pressure points for academic freedom, right? Uh, faculty governance can be restructured in ways that uh, stack the balance in favor of government appointees rather than being, uh, you know, proper reflections of the academic community. Uh, and it's good to hear that, uh, from what you're saying, the faculty governance in the Philippines at least uh, continues to reflect uh, faculty. <laughs> yeah, I just want to make a footnote to that, though. I don't want to paint an overly rosy picture. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, the power resides in the university's board of governance in our mm -hmm. case, uh, governors in our case, or board of regents, rather. And that's stacked, or at least a third of a third to a half are stacked by government appointees. Others like the faculty regent, the student regent, the staff region, we elect them. Mm -hmm. But there, there is a majority of uh, government appointees beholden, presumably, to some extent, to the appointing power, which is the president of the Philippines. Right, right. Uh, uh, turning to uh, to Walid, I mean the the imbalance and the hypocrisy that you refer to, and that we had this conversation on WhatsApp last week. You know, it was also even, was even evident at something like the Golden Globes. You know, uh, Hollywood celebrities routinely have, you know, for many years uh, used award stages to speak out about uh, progressive issues. This year, suddenly, not a single political statement at the Golden Globes, not just not about Palestine, not about anything, right? Not about Black Lives Matter, not about uh, uh, Me Too, nothing, right? So suddenly, en masse, uh, collectively, uh, uh, Hollywood celebrities, the winners, decided that they were nothing more than entertainers, and uh, and you know the the uh, uh, the conclusion that you came to the you know the, the religious leader who who said you know I'm never ever going to listen uh, to a political statement from from you guys again. Yeah, uh, that's exactly how I felt about celebrities on the whole. I don't ever want to hear a Hollywood celebrity tell me anything about politics ever again. Right? Uh, but uh, turning to a question to you, the, the passion that you refer to uh, on the uh, on the ground in Singapore, mainly among the uh, Singapore Muslim community, uh, of course, uh, you know, passions 
of all kinds can easily bubble over, right? And all it would take is for one or two Singaporeans to lose control of their emotions, um, lead to some unfortunate event, uh, uh, and that would be, we know would be seized on by Islamophobes. Uh, as well as by the authorities who would say, look, we told you so, this is why we've got to keep these things um, uh, basically underground, right? Uh, keep them out of the public sphere. I I'm, I'm sure you must be conscious of that risk uh, when you uh, comment on Palestine. Uh, how does that, um, uh, that concern um, uh, you know, feed into the decisions that you make about what to say and how to say it? Right. Uh, thank you so much. So, uh, firstly, to your comment on um, the Golden Globes, I think you and Ricky Gervais and myself have a lot in common that <laughs> although Ricky Gervais did say it last year. So, on this, definitely, it's one of the things that I do, I do think about and I am conscious about, which is why from the start, from the start, I was very clear, and this goes to one of the questions as well. I was very clear that no matter what is the situation, it cannot be that the response is to attack civilians. And it, for me, it's very clear, right? So if people disagree, some people disagree with me and they say, oh no, how, how else are they going to react? I mean, I'm not saying I have the answers. I'm not saying I I can, I of course, I am speaking from the comfort of Singapore, but it's the only perspective I can have, right? I can only see the world through this lens. So uh, I am very uh, clear about that. And I think that should be the principle that people hold. On the other hand, if we do not, if people who I would say are more rational, reasonable, do not call this for what it is, that will only embolden, and it will, this is what JFK said, right? If you make non-violent resistance impossible, you make violent resistance inevitable. I think if we do not speak up about this, for me, if I do not, and the Muslim organizations, Muslim leaders especially, and this is my exhortation, my call to them, if you do not uh, condemn occupation, you do not show empathy for the lives of the Palestinians, and you do not acknowledge the depth of hurt and anguish in the Muslim community, don't be surprised if people then go to look for other leaders. And amongst other leaders, there may be these charlatans, there may be people who are willing to incite. So I think you have to do both. You have to say these are our principles, this is our these are our limits. At the same time, that should be equally applied, whether it's to our friends or to our foes, to our allies or otherwise. And the principle must be that the the killing or the hurting of innocent civilians can never be justified. I hope I answered the question. Yes, thank you. Uh, so we yeah, we do have a number of questions uh, that have come through the QA. We would welcome more. Um the uh, I'm going to read some of them, not necessarily ask for uh, for answers, because uh, you know we do want to stay focused on the topic of today, uh, and of course, understandably, uh, there are a number of people in the audience who want to address the the Palestinian issue as such. Uh, this isn't really uh, in a forum on that issue, but more uh, on how. Uh, academics and other public intellectuals might uh, respond to it. But let, just to give you a flavor of what is being said on the Q&A, uh, Selvaraj says two questions for Walid. Uh, first, are Singaporean Muslims actively lobbying MPs for a ceasefire? Are Singaporeans reaching out across the causeway to show their support? Uh, Kanwaljit Soin, so nice to have you in our audience. Uh, why has the UN failed so miserably in its response uh, to the Gaza-Israeli war? besides the ICJ in The Hague, is there any other international organization that could have intervened meaningfully? Uh, Siraj, uh, Joseph, uh, thank you for your thought-provoking perspectives. What are your thoughts on the responses by uh, us, I guess Hamas, uh, over the years of occupation? Is it justified? Is there a better way to respond, do you think? Um, another member of the audience, uh, Anonymous, uh, what moves this issue from a rational one to an ethical one? Uh, it seems many liberals can intellectually agree with the Palestinian cause, but do not have enough of a state to, as Professor Wallet says, to do away with the excuses on taking a clear moral stance. Um, uh, Catherine Lim, uh, you are more than uh, you are more than disappointed with your friends who are silent or condemn Palestinians but not Israel. Uh, you are still friends, though. How? 
What goes through your thought process or your heart that allows you to still hold them as friends? Uh, what are you hoping to happen and how are you going about it on a personal and professional basis? Uh, another anonymous attendee, is it feasible to distinguish support for the Palestinian cause from backing Hamas uh, and how? Um, my hesitation stems from Hamas's anti-Semitic beliefs um denial of its of the holocaust and so on uh, so again there are far too many um uh, yeah. things we can deal with uh I, I will take some of these questions as just uh, reflective of this dilemma that uh you know uh, or, or this, this frustration that uh, that many of us have uh, why aren't things happening that should be happening uh who can we turn to and so on but perhaps the the, the one that uh is most fruitful for this forum uh, to, to to hear your answers to uh, would be the one on friendship, right? Because I think this does uh, is the kind of thing that um, uh, transcends this issue. Uh, yeah. It's often the case that uh, progressive uh, scholars, those out um, out who are not at the center, who are pushing issues and so on, uh, face uh, this this similar struggle. Right, you know, how do you deal with uh, um, with friends who might not live up to your <laughs> uh, to your expectations? Do, do you want to, and maybe both of you could address that. You know, um, uh, to repeat the question, what goes through your thought process or your heart that allows you to still hold them as friends? Yeah, uh, thank you. I think this is a question I am grappling with personally, uh, and. Um, I don't think I have the answer to this yet. Usually my answer would be, you know, you, you have to share the space with people whom you disagree with, right? And and that's just part of life. Um, this time around, I do believe that it's super personal. Uh, so I do, I do uh, still want, I do still want to hold on to that principle. Maybe I, I still need some time before I go back uh, to that principle. But... I think that is ultimately the way for us to go, right? We cannot abandon every single friend or every, otherwise we'll, we'll have no friends. And also the, the idea should be to get them on site, right? Through continual discussions and through maintaining those friendships, you are able to have these discussions more, hopefully. Uh, so I think that rationally, that should be the approach and that will be the approach that I will take in. Give me, give me some time, but emotionally, I'm not in the space to do that yet. Yeah. So uh, I, I like that point that uh, maybe not call out or judge them too harshly, call them in and try to engage, but it, it must be a struggle. Uh, so, indeed, indeed. Uh, we, we need yeah. to call out as much as we call in, or we need to call in as much as we call. Right. Uh, so, I mean, in a different context, uh, you must, um, and academics like you must be facing this and must have faced this over many years uh, beyond academia with friends, relatives, and so on. I mean, on the one hand, you are uh, dealing with, um, you know, authoritarian populists or dictators who have done tremendous harm uh, and yet are probably, uh, probably many people who are close to you, friends, family, um, are fans of theirs. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you manage this? Um, <clears throat> one of the more divisive uh, uh, moments, I suppose, was when Duterte was running for the presidency and when he got elected initially, I think. There were a lot more divisions uh, among people that I knew personally, my family, my friends. Um, but then as Duterte's presidency became more and more murderous, I think that started to shift the balance of opinion, at least among the circles I'm in. And unfortunately or unfortunately, I realized that I do, I do live in quite the bubble. And also, I don't really engage that much on social media. Um, I've used my social media accounts mostly with regard to my research and my activism. And um, and so I, I don't feel it as much, I suppose, um, at a personal level. Um, on Palestine, uh, what I have experienced and what I uh, appreciate um, being in the Philippines has been that we, I think, have a lot more academic freedom to talk about it than our um, colleagues in the US and Europe, for example. 
um, we have uh, like I've been I've been part of at least let me think now at least one or or uh, at least one major event. Um, it was organized by the Philippine Political Science Association where we talked about we talked about Palestine about a month or so into uh, since uh, after the October seven attacks by Hamas. And um, the perspective personally that I took was that I'm not a and I'm not an expert on Palestine. <clears throat> But my research is on political violence, and I, I can talk about, and I can, you know, I, I can be very blunt about my assessment that it's a genocide, that what we're seeing is ethnic cleansing, that what has uh, pervaded has been an apartheid over many decades, you know, so incompatible with Israeli democracy, for example. So these, the, this sort of, um, in contrast to uh perspectives that come from specific communities, like Muslim communities, for instance, that Walid was talking about. Um, what I've seen in the Philippine case is the sort of universality of how we feel as, as human beings, seeing these uh, rights being completely trampled upon, the horror at, 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 at which, you know, all of this is unfolding before our eyes. And I'm not, and I, I think, that worldwide, the Philippines included, there's a growing gulf between how people, ordinary people feel about the issue and their governments. So um, yeah, I guess that, that was just my own reflection on the, on the question. Yeah, I mean, indeed, it's, it is striking how uh, global many of these um, uh, these struggles and dilemmas are. Walla, did you want to jump in on something? Okay, right. Uh, th there's a question uh, for both of you in chat, which I would, uh, it's longer, so I, invite, I would invite you to uh, read the Q&A, uh, the long one third from the top, uh, third from the bottom. Um, so for both panelists, what is the line between activism as public intellectuals and academic integrity, which requires a commitment to study and teach complex truths for you? Um, I guess that question is getting at whether, in fact, activism uh, requires a certain commitment to a side that uh, that is in conflict with the kind of disinterestedness that uh, rigorous yeah. academic uh, work requires. Um, uh, and there are some specific sub-questions uh, dealing with that. But can I can I invite you to... Um, yeah, so you, you want to well, yeah, sure. That's all. Well, yeah, I, I can just uh, start briefly. Um, I think there's a growing recognition in academia that um, there are no neutral. There's nothing. There's no such thing as being neutral, really. Yes, being dispassionate. Yes, being um, uh, rigorous in one's methods. Clearly, um, uh, holding to the truth as best you know it, and not manufacturing, you know, manufacturing lies. Um, so it's, it's, it's more important to be, uh, explicit about your, your position on things, um, rather than, uh, rather than pretend that one can be neutral. So I think there are certain, there are certain, um, especially for political scientists, um, it's, it's, it's hard to be completely dispassionate, right? Um, and so, uh, to some extent, um, there's a permeous, per, a permeable wall for me at least between my research and my um, activism or my outreach type of activities. But what's clear to me is that when I speak um, and when I engage as a public intellectual, it's based on my research. You know, it's based on uh, it's based on what I know because that's the value added I have um, for public discourse. It's to talk about. Um, the, the you know to 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 be evidence based uh, to have an empir sound empirical footing to be on sound empirical footing when talking about policy and political issues. Um, about books that should be legitimately banned, honestly, I mean, I I would I would err on the side on the side of not banning anything. I mean, um, of course, uh, freedom of expression is not without limit. Incitement to hatred, for example, you know these sorts of uh, these sorts of things uh, uh, should not be tolerated. But you know, I don't, I can't think of a specific book really 
um, that that I would advocate banning. Just to, what's more important to me is that we educate ourselves and we educate um, the public and our students um, to equip them with the critical uh, skills to 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 evaluate um, the content uh, that they are uh, exposed to. I'm going to ask uh, Wallet to sort of uh, end by responding to the same question. But uh, before you do, can I, uh, uh, Saul, refer you to a question from uh, Meredith Weiss. Again, great to have you in the audience, Meredith, um, uh, who wants to come back to the question on friendship. In line with the question of friendship, I'm curious about the climate for teaching on these issues, Duterte, Marcos, Palestine, uh, given the likely divisions among students. Uh, thorny issues can be fantastic for spurring critical thinking among students, but students may not be so prepared to set aside polarized perspectives and or fear of pushback may lead uh, administrators to impose uh, constraints. And I guess it's a question actually for uh, for Wallet as well. Um, how uh, is it an issue, the fact that you might have uh, students who uh, might not be prepared to go in the directions that you're prepared to go. Did you want me to briefly answer yeah, and then while so it would close? Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, I I think that, um, yeah, th there are these divisions, but again, like in the particular university that I teach at, I think the, the um, bias might be on the left side of things rather than the right. Um, but our students often, you know, especially after high school, uh, the exposure to to uh, kind of ideas that they get, um, uh, the, the the kind of exposure that they get at the university um, is really eye opening from them. I've heard this time and time again from my students. So I suppose um, as long as uh, in the classroom, especially, but not just in the classroom, you know, we have public lectures, um, seminars. Uh, Organize, student organizations are really active. They organize their own um, policy debates and so on. As long as we keep the space open and we keep the space, you know, and, and foster an environment for healthy intellectual and public debate, I think we're okay. Thanks, Meredith. Thank you. Uh, well, let's uh, uh, start with the question on students. Uh, is that um, a concern yeah. for you? Yeah, so thank you. I think my, my answers mirror Sol's answer. So I I think uh, if we cannot discuss these issues in university, then they are, we are in trouble. And like it or not, they are going to discuss it somewhere. They're going to discuss it online and so on. So at least we equip them with the tools to discuss this. And I think uh, it's related to the earlier question on activism as well, even though I have uh, stances. My job in the classroom is to ensure as safe and environment for open discussions as as possible and I think some of my students are here and I would say I always start every class with say uh, with saying that this class is a safe space for thought not from thought right? so there will be ideas that will make you uncomfortable and that's okay that's part of life right uh, and so I have to accept that as well and I would be very sad if a student who is who holds a pro-Israeli opinion for instance but feels dissuaded, discouraged from speaking up in class because that person knows my own personal views on that. Because my job is to ensure that that person is also safe to to articulate their opinions. Right. Uh, so if if that happens, then I think I sort of have failed in in the classroom. So I wouldn't be too worried about encouraging uh, uh having these types of discourses in in, in classrooms. Although I mean, if uh Prof Meredith wife's Meredith wife is saying that. In America, then in Singapore, where you don't even have a culture of such open discussion, then it's much harder to, to have it. Um, but I guess it's also less emotional in Singapore because people are more far removed from it. In, uh, but the, I would the, say the, the culture may be more open here, but I suspect uh, these issues are more politicized in the US. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, so that, that's, yeah. Uh, that's uh, because we are in, in Singapore, people generally do not have too strong opinions on this other than. Uh, other than maybe specific quotes, right? Uh, on activism, likewise, uh, I think so. Uh, give an excellent answer. I, uh, when I started my PhD, I remember there were some senior professors who who said, "You are an an academic. You are not an activist." 
I remember uh, them telling, discouraging. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Was it frowned upon back then? Activism in academia, but you know, in it has sort of changed, right? In Singapore as well. I mean, academia SG is testament for that, right? Where academics but we're are not we're not mainstream though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. But we're we're uh, a bad so... indicator of what <laughs> is. I'm saying that or scene... or a good start. Or yeah, a good, yeah, start. A good start. Yeah, the scene has changed a little, right? So I I do not think that it's uh it's in the past. This idea that. Oh, academics have to be objective and neutral, and so it's never been true, right? It's just that what side you take, that objectivity or neutrality usually just means taking the side of the status quo and an uncontroversial stand, and being activist means taking the opinion that is not status quo, right? So I have to, I have to reject that characterization. I think at the same time we have to be careful, um, like for the more activist type of academics, right? our methodologies should guard against our biases, right? And that's where I think uh, how we can be true to our activism and, uh, and maintain our research and integrity. And if people ask me, am I partial? Of course, I am partial to justice. I am partial to peace. I am partial to fairness. I am partial to democracy and equality. I am partial to all of that. And I don't think we should make any apologies for that. I think uh, well, that's a wonderful way to 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 end the discussion, and I just want to uh, echo what you've said and say that's probably the approach that uh, that uh, myself and my colleagues at Academia SG uh, take as well. And, I mean, clearly we stand for certain values, uh, including the values that you've articulated uh, so well. And in that sense, of course we're biased. Uh, of course we're not uh, disinterested. Uh, but it is really the the method, the 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 discipline of verification, right? Uh, the openness to um, uh, to views that uh, to consider views that may be opposed to us, the willingness to change our minds. Um, that is what I think we mean when we say, uh, you know, let's do the stuff that we do with a certain amount of rigor, uh, rather than to uh, to somehow become non-human and and not have values uh, because if, if so then what is life for right um uh, thanks for this wonderful um uh, discussion uh, i did uh, say at the beginning of the session that um uh, this the first event of the year in a way is uh, very timely because uh, a major theme for for us at academia as we this year uh, is um knowledge um, different forms of knowledge uh, and the obstacles that um, uh, lie in the way, not just of academia, but other sources of knowledge. And I'm going to invite uh, my colleague, Tio Yu Yen, uh, to join us uh, to tell us about some of our exciting plans and also just to wrap up and thank you and uh, uh, say goodnight to all of us. Yu Yen. Okay. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, first, thank you, Sol and Walid, so much for that really rich discussion for the work you do, which is really difficult, and um, for so candidly and generously you know, sharing your experiences. Um, and I, I think it's because you both speak with such grace and, and are so articulate, it's not, it's not always obvious how vulnerable you're making yourselves in sharing some of these experiences, and I think that really takes a great deal of both courage and generosity. So thank you for that. Um, over the past few years, we at Academia SG have seen that there's a broad range of people working in different disciplines and various modalities, uh, working to understand and to imagine Singapore society. And many like, like you care to bring their work out of their own domains into engagement with a wider public. All this has been tremendously energizing and we're very impressed by and have learned much from colleagues both in and outside of academia. And we've seen as, and heard as well as we did tonight that there are specific challenges and tensions in doing this work, yeah, in trying to, to bridge, right? Some kind of uh, make, create some links between the knowledge production process and then a broader public. Uh, particularly for people who approach with frames and methods that are at odds and challenging to the status quo. So it seems timely 
to bring people together to reflect on these conditions that affect knowledge production work in different fields of activity. And through collective reflection, identify the most promising ways to amplify our work and to connect with one another and the wider public. So this May, through a pair of workshops, we hope to bring together academics, artists, journalists, activists, and others who are broadly speaking, doing the work of knowledge production to reflect on our practices, experiences, and hopes, and both the constraints we encounter as well as the possibilities for working through them. So we hope many um, who are attending tonight, uh, many of you will find that this effort is resonant and we invite you to propose presentations for the event. We define knowledge in its broadest possible sense, not just research findings, but also understandings of humanity and society that are explored through art, professional practice, and activism or community engagement. In fact, although we are a group of academics and we focus, we have focused our efforts primarily on championing scholarship on Singapore, we hope for this to be an opportunity to build thicker links across a wider and more diverse community and for us to learn new things precisely by bringing together people who operate with different tools using different paradigms. So a detailed call for proposals, including some themes that may be helpful to think with is already on our website. We hope to receive many proposals for presentations by January 20th. Please have a look. Please share it with others who may be interested. Um, and we hope that we will be able to see a lot of people uh, in person yeah, in, in May and continue some of these um, conversations that, that we've been having, including tonight. Oh, am I supposed to say goodbye? Okay. Yes, <laughs> so with that, thank you everyone for attending and for those really excellent questions. And most of all, thank you, Sol and Walid, for this just wonderful session. Bye-bye. Thank Bye, you. Bye, everyone. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.